There are many ways in which a person can boldly go where no one has gone before. One of the most fascinating and mysterious of these adventures involves going to the bathroom in outer space. Logistically, biologically, socially, there are a lot of complicated factors to work out here. This is how astronauts boldly go in space. Okay, let's establish some ground rule terminologies here. We want this to be a fun, informative kind of video and avoid going anywhere too grossly or overly explanatory. So we all know what number one refers to. Yeah, we all know number two. Let's just stick with that. So the first American to ever fly above the Earth's atmosphere and enter the final frontier, Alan Shepard, would also gain the notoriety of becoming the first person to go number one inside a spacecraft. Since this was a suborbital mission, there was never much thought put into the biological aspect of human spaceflight. Shepard was only scheduled to be gone for about 15 minutes, so they all kind of just assumed he would hold it. Unfortunately, delays with the ground system left Shepard waiting on the launch pad strapped into his capsule for hours. Eventually, the time came when a number one couldn't hold on any longer. Shepard got the okay from Mission Control, who gave the order to, quote, do it in the suit. This ended up shorting out a bunch of the biosensors that were attached to Shepard's body to monitor his vital signs, in addition to leaving him a bit damp. But the man was an American hero. He soldiered on. This did mean that when it came time for longer duration orbital spaceflight, the very smart people at NASA were put to the task on an adequate waste collection system. John Glenn was the first American astronaut to complete a full orbit of the Earth, and along with him was sent the first apparatus to collect a number one in space. It was a containment bag that was worn around the waist, kind of like a belt, that connected to the male anatomy with a hose a roll-on sheath that was basically a latex condom, and a valve to ensure the flow only traveled in one direction. You can see this for yourself if you're into that kind of thing. The actual urine containment system worn by John Glenn is on display at the National Air and Space Museum. Now, since a body in orbit will experience weightlessness, there really is no up or down. This makes it a little strange to try and contain liquids, and that goes for inside the human body as well. Without gravity to weigh you down, the bladder can hold more volume before it starts to feel full. The average maximum bladder capacity on Earth is 20 ounces, but in space, that expands to 27 ounces. This same condom hose and waste bag system was used by astronauts through the 1960s and early 70s. All of the people being launched into space were male, so that kept things pretty simple in that regard, though there was an added complication that arose from this system. You see, the condoms were sized small, medium, and large, with a tight fit being pretty essential for leak-free operation. But when it comes to the astronauts of the early space race, their large ego drew them to the large size, even if they didn't have the equipment to match. This actually became problematic for NASA spaceflight management, and they eventually moved to implement vanity sizing on the number one containment systems, changing the names to large, gigantic, and humongous. When NASA constructed the Apollo Command Module for missions to the moon, they installed what you might call the first space urinal. It was a hose connected to the wall that could receive the number one and then eject it out into space. This had to be done strategically because you'd end up with a big yellow cloud forming outside the spacecraft. As for the number two in space, this is where things get complicated. There was no good answer to this situation during the first decade of human spaceflight, an era that saw multi-day excursions to the moon and back, meaning that holding it was not going to be an option. The best that NASA could muster was a plastic bag and some tape. It was far from ideal, and the containment of both odor and solid matter left a lot to be desired. NASA kept meticulous transcripts of every word said in each Apollo mission, so we know that on Apollo 10, astronaut Tom Stafford experienced a malfunction with the bag system and exclaimed, Give me a napkin quick, there's a turd floating through the air. Much of the captured number two was then returned to Earth where it would be meticulously studied by NASA scientists, 
we were still trying to learn as much as possible about the effects of outer space on the human body, so this was one of the better resources that was available. Anyway, things started to turn around when NASA developed their first space station, Skylab. This was the mid-1970s, and the plan was to have astronauts doing the first experiments with long-duration stays in microgravity. This necessitated a bit of an upgrade in the bathroom department. So the bags and hoses were out. Skylab featured the very first space toilet, if you could really call it that, more like a space outhouse. What they got was really a hole in the wall with suction, but it worked well enough. Moving into the late 1970s and the space shuttle program was when NASA finally started to get serious about the space toilet. One key reason being that NASA and human spaceflight had evolved. There were now male and female astronauts flying on the shuttle program, and that means that the old systems won't do. The key principle behind doing any type of business in space, number one or two, is suction. This is how we make up for the absence of gravity. We need to apply some external force to ensure the flow of material moves in the direction we want it. So when it comes to the number one, we get a hose that connects to the equivalent of a vacuum cleaner with a series of cup and cone attachments to fit the various biological apparatus. This was an upgrade in both convenience and personal hygiene. Now for anyone who may have just started eyeing up their vacuum cleaner, I see you and don't even bother, it only works in zero gravity, you'll ruin your vacuum and make a mess. When we get to the number two, things improve even more. The handheld bag and tape system is replaced by a canister that the astronaut can sit down on using thigh straps to maintain a tight seal. The can also has vacuum suction to keep matter flowing away from the body, and the number twos are going to be held in a bag with an elastic opening to keep things tight. Once the operation is complete, the bag is sealed and compacted down into a storage container. The compacting process is essentially just cramming it down in there with a stick. The container can hold around 30 average number two sessions. When it came time to develop the International Space Station, the process of going in outer space had to be tightly integrated into the station systems. The space toilet design mostly carried over from the space shuttle, but now engineers had to think in much longer timeframes. You can't just store the waste until the toilet returns to Earth anymore. On the number two side of things, the process is fairly simple. Once the storage container is full, the contents are transferred out for the disposal into space. Now, they don't just launch number two into space, that would be dangerous. Once the Cygnus cargo supply spacecraft has been unloaded, it essentially becomes a dumpster for the ISS. The number two, along with all of the other trash and waste from the station, is piled into the Cygnus, which is then deorbited and burns up in the Earth's atmosphere, vaporizing any waste in the process. You may be wondering, what happens to the number one though? Well, let's talk about water reclamation. You know how in the Dune universe, Paul Atreides and the Fremen all wear still suits that preserve their moisture and bodily fluids to keep them alive in the desert of Arrakis? Well, the ISS does pretty much the same thing. There's no room to waste water in space, so all of the number one on the station is run through a series of filters until it is reintroduced to the water system. So yeah, astronauts drink pee. That's just the way it is. Apparently there's a saying on the ISS, yesterday's coffee is today's coffee. In 2020, NASA deployed their newly developed space toilet Mark II. It cost the agency $23 million, likely making it the most expensive toilet in the world, at least as far as I can tell. One of the key objectives with the new space toilet was to make something that could be standardized across all NASA-involved spacecraft and orbital infrastructure like the ISS, the Orion Lunar Capsule, and the HLS Moon Lander. NASA made the new design as simple, compact, and easy to maintain as possible. Yes, there are plumbing issues in space. The previous ISS toilet was known to clog, leak, and break down, making for a pretty miserable situation for all involved. One way they do this is by pre-treating the number one with a strong acid that breaks down any solid material. NASA is currently researching the future of space toilets for long-duration missions to the Moon and Mars, though this one is not exactly pleasant to hear about. Remember when we talked about water reclamation systems for the number one? Well, that's also being explored for the number two as well, which is typically still 75% water, and when we're talking about a two or three year round trip to Mars, 
this is the kind of system that is going to be necessary to keep people alive. We can also use waste byproducts to build houses on the moon and Mars. No, we won't be sculpting with number two. When you extract the drinkable water from the number one, you're left with a compound called urea, which can be mixed with the surface dust, also called regolith, and that combination will form a geopolymer, which can then be used to build structures like landing pads and habitats. So not only is going to the bathroom in space an adventure all in itself, it can actually help to make human life multi-planetary. That's the thing Elon Musk won't tell you, but you heard it here.